one of the most interesting elements of video games as a medium is seeing the ways in which digital interactivity influences how a genre is experienced. Some genres, like comedy, can make the jump but have to be adjusted to fit the conventions of the medium. The way you tell a joke is different when it's a comic strip or an entirely scripted movie versus a video game, where every character is on a script waiting for the one guy who's improving his way through the scene to interact with them. Puzzles aren't really something we would even think of as a genre in a lot of other media, like puzzle movies aren't really a thing, but the nature of video games allows you to have an entire puzzle genre full of really creative stories. However, what I want to explore in this video is the genres of media that video games struggle with. Genres that are far more prevalent or popular in other media for one reason or another, while being rare if not entirely absent from video games. The medium of video games has expanded our ability to tell so many stories in so many different ways. But a medium is defined as much by its limitations as its strengths, and there's a lot to learn about video games as a medium by exploring what doesn't work, rarely works, and barely works. Part 0. What is genre? Before we go forward, I just want to briefly touch on what I mean when I talk about genres so we're all on the same page. A genre can refer to a lot of different things. It might refer to the content of a piece of media, such as comedy or tragedy genres, or it could refer to how that content is presented, such as a silent film or a visual novel. Importantly, genres aren't codified in a hard and fast way. They tend to develop semi-organically to meet the needs of producers, publishers, and consumers of media to sum up the vibes of a given piece they have an idea how to make it, market it, and find it if it's something they like. New genres pop up kinda as needed when a piece of media can't really be effectively summed up by any of our current genres, such as how the science fiction genre came into existence as a consequence of Frankenstein. And sometimes a broad genre like comedy won't describe a piece of media accurately enough, so we have subgenres like black comedies or romantic comedies if we need to be more specific. Genres aren't inherently prescriptive, obviously, but they do still have tropes that tend to be common across them. You know, there's not a rule book for making an action movie, but action movies will often share a lot of characteristics because they work well for telling action stories. This is especially easy to see in music. Like, is Lord's Royals a pop song or an alt song? I mean, well, if it hadn't been so popular at the time, we probably would have called it alt. But it ended up being so popular that it not only was pop music, but it kind of shifted what pop music was into a genre that had more of an alt-pop vibe. On the flip side, is Old Town Road a country song? Well, that depends on what actually is necessary for something to be a country song. Country music's had a long struggle with what actually constitutes real country music, particularly as they've gone through waves of different types of country, like bro country, boyfriend country, and whatever the fuck ronky tonk country is supposed to be. Video games have a really interesting relationship with genre because of the interactive nature of them, and that adds a whole new layer to this discussion. An action game that's a third-person shooter is very different from an action game with the same story that's a tactical RPG in terms of how you make it and experience it. A lot of video game genres are specifically based on mechanics that certain games pioneered. You have roguelikes and roguelites that are both derived from rogue, you have metroidvanias that are building upon the mechanics from metroid and castlevania games, and you have soulsborne games that not only incorporate mechanics from dark souls and bloodborne, but also the element of difficulty. Even if a genre is shared from medium to medium, the medium itself will still dramatically affect how we interpret it. For example, let's say you want to tell a story about Batman where he defeats the Joker. Telling it through the medium of film will have a different impact than telling it through the medium of a comic book or a video game, even if the exact same events are happening. When you turn the page to see Batman delivering an uppercut to the Joker to win a fight, it hits different than pressing a button to deliver that same uppercut, or watching a pair of actors actively performing the scene. Similarly, a horror game is a fundamentally different experience from a horror movie in a lot of ways because of the level of control you have over what's happening. Both for better and for worse, there are elements of horror movies that are more scary and more impactful because you don't have control. And there are elements of horror games that are much more impactful because of the control you have. And all of that will change how you tell the story, how you market the story, and how that story affects you. The point that I want to get across is that genre is a fluid concept both within video games and beyond them. Finding something as part of one genre or another, or deciding which collection of genres to use to define a piece of media, is a lot harder than just checking a box and deciding that it matches that one thing. Genres help us understand what kind of media exists, what kind of media we like, and what kind of experience we will have with a given piece of media. But they're not natural. They're not natural laws. They're not things that come from, you know, the heavens above. They're things we've built, and that's something we need to keep in mind. For our purposes though, we're going to really hone in on how the medium affects the genre, focusing on three specific genres in the context of video games. True crime, tabletop role-playing games, and musicals. And now that we're hopefully all on the same page, let's get into the real meat of the video. Part 1. True crime. So, this is a topic I've actually wanted to talk about for a little while. It was one of the very earliest members' choice topics before it got dropped, but thankfully it's getting brought back for this Donathon reward video. So, for the unfamiliar, I'll catch you up really quickly, the true crime genre is basically what it says on the tin. It's content focused on discussion of real world crimes. They are really popular online right now in terms of podcasts, YouTube videos, TikToks, stuff like that, but there's also plenty of traditional media on the subject. If I wanted to be bold and controversial, I'd say that there's a lot of news coverage that probably qualifies as true crime content more than actual news, but there's also plenty of books and movies in that same genre going back way through time. There's also a ton of true crime content on television that's more reality TV, you know, Dog the Bounty Hunter or To Catch a Predator, that's a bit different than how we sort of perceive and interpret the concept of true crime today. 
in TV and movies today, it's usually stuff like Dahmer or extremely wicked, shockingly evil and vile, where it's, you know, based on a true story kind of performances of stories. Whereas online media tends to be more of a story time style presentation where a single person just kind of narrates the story of what happens to you. Again, this is a very popular genre. I'm sure that you've heard of it, you've heard about it, or you've heard controversies related to it. There are conventions, there are meetups, and real-world investigations being affected by media in this genre. It is also a hugely controversial genre for a few reasons, most of them pretty obvious. For one, it's not like true crime is covering like financial crime for the most part. White-collar crime isn't really that appealing in that way. There's a saying in news about how if it bleeds, it leads, and true crime very much so follows that. True crime is most commonly associated with violent crime, particularly murders, kidnappings, assaults, stuff like that. And there are some very understandable criticisms of the genre for taking these real-world acts of brutality and turning them into, like, get-ready-with-me makeup videos with a Squarespace sponsorship, especially when real-world people are still affected by these stories. Surviving victims of these crimes, as well as their loved ones, are often not stoked about the idea of these traumatic events being turned into profit and entertainment off the back of their suffering, particularly when certain creators are particularly disrespectful of victims in terms of exploiting their story or doing insufficient research. They don't say that every subject of a true crime story or their loved ones are immediately opposed to them. Content creators who cover unsolved crimes sometimes get a lot of support from the families of the victims who want to know what happened and want justice, and some of those cases have reignited investigations and reopened cold cases. However, in the context of this video, I want to talk about why this hugely influential and popular genre hasn't really ever been a thing in video games. Back when I first proposed talking about this, the two reasons that people gave me a lot in the comments for why they thought this was the case was that, you know, one, true crime tends to appeal to women while video games don't, and two, true crime is too controversial for too many publishers to want to take a swing at it. I think the second one doesn't really hold based purely on the fact that video games as a medium have never been afraid to be controversial, and even if mainstream studios aren't going to do it, there are plenty of games created for pure shock value from indies or smaller companies or individuals, and yet we don't really see that much true crime stuff popping up like that. When it comes to the women don't play video games thing, I think it's just silly. Women do play games. That's just a statement of fact. After all, if women disproportionately consume true crime content in other media, it's not like they wouldn't also be willing to consume a true crime game if it could scratch the same itch. What I would argue is that video games aren't capable of scratching the same itch as other true crime media because the distance from the experience is inherently part of the appeal of true crime content. It's voyeuristic, it's investigative, it's narrative, and it's from a safe distance. This isn't a dig at the people who enjoy true crime, to be clear, particularly since I think a lot of the digs at true crime fans are often just, like, taking digs at women in a really sexist way. You've got James Summerton's argument that women enjoyed Dahmer because he was killing men so they didn't feel at risk. This isn't about the fans of true crime being women or anything like that. The point is more so that true crime as a genre has a unique appeal in a middle ground between the safety of a fictional crime story and the tension and stress of a more interactive experience, and a video game's interactivity makes it really hard to maintain that balance. There's also a challenge of how you present it in a video game. You know, do you allow people to do investigations like they're playing Ace Attorney? What about more of a Telltale style game? How graphic are you going to get with it? Do you go for realism? Do you go for like a stylized thing? Regardless of what you do, making an interactive experience in any way dramatically influences how people perceive a true crime because the audience loses that distance between themselves and the portrayal of real world brutality. On top of that, video games as a medium have kind of a unique risk of a press F to pay respect situation where the seriousness of a moment is really undercut by the interactive nature. The appeal of true crime isn't exclusively the idea of say voyeurism from a distance, but video games remove the distance by putting you in the experience to an extent that I don't think it's compatible. People do certainly enjoy video games about fictional murders, especially as mysteries, and it's not like it's impossible to see how you can make a Kodaka slash Ichikoshi style visual novel to tell the story of a real world serial killer if you wanted to. But I think the appeal of something like Eye of the Somnium Files would be very different, and frankly, a lot worse if you knew that Shoko Nadami was a real woman who was murdered. Anyways, I've got other things to say about the other genres in this video, so in order to avoid this getting too long, we should probably move on to the next part. Part 2 Tabletop Role Playing Games. Now, you might be thinking this is kind of a silly thing to talk about in this video, either because you think tabletop role-playing games aren't a genre, or because you're thinking of the games that are based on TTRPGs, and I promise I will discuss both of those. For the unaware, tabletop role-playing games are kind of, again, what they say on the tin. Think Dungeons & Dragons type of thing, where there's typically a group of players being directed by a human game master. Individual players will typically play a character of their own, while every other element of the world, from the quests they do to the NPCs they talk to, is going to be directed by the game master. Players are role-playing as their character when they talk to those NPCs, or fight them, or complete those quests, usually using skill checks where players combine their character's skill points with dice rolls or some other way of combining skill sets with random choice. TTRPGs are really open-ended in terms of what can happen in one or what kind of TTRPG they can be. They're inherently very fluid, and as any good GM will tell you, they're very much so a collaborative storytelling experience where everyone is able and encouraged to improvise, try and solve problems in their own ways, and you can get real stupid with it. Now, as the first argument that I talked about before, I would counter that if video games can have genres, so can physical games. TTRPGs are a genre of tabletop games just like how FPS games are a genre of video games. Change my mind. 
As to the second argument I made before, I'll redirect you to the title of the video. It's not about genres that don't exist in video games, but the ones that video games as a medium struggle with, and TTRPGs are very much so a struggle in gaming for a big reason. Namely, the appeal of a TTRPG is the way that you can do anything, and the GM can respond, while a video game can only respond to things it's programmed to respond to, and can only respond in ways it's been programmed to do. A computer can't be a collaborative storytelling partner, and if you're trying to replicate the TTRPG genre in a video game, the challenge is to try and create a program that can get as close as possible. The problem there is that if you've ever tried to GM a tabletop game, you will quickly learn that you could spend hours and hours meticulously planning a campaign, only for the players to immediately walk off the path that you've set for them and get distracted by a one-off comment from an NPC that you didn't even give a real name to. With a real-world tabletop role-playing game, this is where the skills of the GM come in. How well are you able to improv when the players go off the path? You can come up with it on the fly of your own accord, whether that involves trying to steer them back to the path you set before, or trying to build a new one as the players walk. A video game can't do that, it can't improvise. Instead of being reactive, they have to be proactive. And that takes a lot more resources. To continue the paths analogy, a real-world tabletop role-playing game is, you know, you build one path, you maybe have some ideas of where other paths might go, or how else you might get to the destination, and you might have to build a new one as you go if they go way off any of them. A video game that's trying to replicate the TTRPG experience is going to have to try and build every conceivable path that they want players to even consider doing, or even ones they don't want them to consider doing, and try and figure out how the game will respond to them in advance, which is obviously very resource intensive. This can kind of go in one of two directions a lot of the time. You know, you can either have the Cyberpunk 2077s of the world, where TTRPG inspirations are definitely there, like it's based on a tabletop game, but they are very much so watered down to meet the needs of a video game better. Or you can try to make Baldur's Gate 3. Baldur's Gate 3 is a genuine marvel in terms of how close it gets to that feeling of a TTRPG and its adaptability in terms of the choices players can make without running into limitations. When it came out, there was a lot of discourse about how this is what games should be, and you know, sure, that'd be nice, Baldur's Gate 3 was awesome, there's a reason why people aren't just doing that. Not just deciding to make bad games for a reason. Hell, Mr. We find Larian could barely do what Larian did. They were frankly working with advantages most studios would never have access to. They had an established franchise already, they were working with Wizards of the Coast, like they had advantages here that make it especially easy, and even then, it was hard. It takes money and time and really good management to make a game like this, and it is a hard sell to a publisher, even at the best of times. However, given the state of the industry right now in terms of things like monetization, we're not in the best of times. It's especially hard to get someone to invest in a game like this. Like this is a full price AAA game with no gotcha, no loot boxes, no battle passes, no microtransactions, and no day one DLC, nothing like that. Basically, TTRPGs are a struggle for video games for a few reasons. First, it's really hard to proactively program a game to the extent that it's able to accommodate enough freedom of choice to create that simulacrum of a real life game master. And second, it's really hard to get the funding, resources, and time necessary to even attempt to do it. It's not impossible to do, but this type of storytelling requires the gaming industry to buck basically every financial incentive and trend and take a gamble that they might be able to manage to pull off a miracle. This is before you even get into things like hardware limitations. Like, Baldur's Gate 3 isn't the kind of game you could have played on just any PC or console. Even if Baldur's Gate 3 could have been built 20 years ago, and it's entirely possible it could have been, would there have been any commercially available hardware you could play it on? Are there still a lot of people who can't experience the game at its best because they can't afford that equipment? Anyways, we've got just one more genre to talk about, and I think, personally, it's honestly the most interesting one in this video. Part 3. Musicals. This is what we've been building up to for this whole video. Musicals are like one of the longest running types of media we have. Using music to tell a story is some shit we've been doing for ages. If there's a way for you to tell a story with an audio component, you can make it a musical, and people have. You've got musicals on stage, musicals on television, musicals on radio, musicals on film, musicals everywhere. Even though musicals aren't always the most popular type of media and have a lot of stigma attached to them, they are one of the staples of almost every medium. Video games are a really interesting medium here because music games are definitely a staple. Whether we're talking about dancing games, rhythm action games, singing games, or games where you're playing plastic instruments, it's not like gamers don't play plenty of games where music's a big component. The interactivity of video games allows for music to be something that you don't just spectate, but something you engage with and participate in, which does really change our relationship to it. Like, what comes to mind when you think of Dragon Forces through the fire and the flames? If you're anything like me, it's shredding your fingers trying to beat it in Guitar Hero 3 on the hardest difficulty you can. You know what I mean here. That's not a way of experiencing a song that you'd get from listening to it as just an audio recording, or watching a music video, or even necessarily literally learning how to play the song. A literal guitar doesn't give you star power for bonus points if you hit the whammy on a long note, or force you to start over if you miss too many of them. And when it comes to musicals and games, you're probably either thinking that there aren't really any, or you've played Stray Gods and you think you know where I'm going here. Stray Gods is an excellent musical that I highly recommend anyone play where your character, Grace, is a singer who inherits the powers of Calliope, the muse after someone murders her. Athena and the rest of the chorus of gods, who are called idols in this story, accuse you of murdering Calliope and give you a week to prove your innocence. You sing your way through the story, using Calliope's powers to draw the truth out of the other characters in really fun musical bits where you can change the tone by choosing different routes. You can be compassionate, confrontational, or clever, and you can change it up throughout the song. 
song, changing the verses that both Grace and her fellow performers will sing and the conclusions they'll reach. Stray Gods is great, but after I played it, it really made me ask the question that inspired this video. Why is one of the oldest genres in media so rare in gaming? And look, there are a few obvious challenges here. First of all, musical theater nerds are not the same kind of nerds as the STEM nerds who make games or the gamer nerds who play them all the time. Not that there isn't overlap, but I hope we can all agree, they tend to fall into some different camps. Second, an inherently interactive medium presents some real challenges to a musical performance. If you give the player too much control, you give them the ability to ruin a big dramatic musical climax. But giving them less control begs the question of why you wouldn't just make a musical in a different medium. The third thing you have to decide is what kind of musical you want to make. Are you making a jukebox musical like Mamma Mia or Glee, or are we getting original songs like Hamilton or Beauty and the Beast? If it's a jukebox musical, you can't really have the kinds of dynamic songs that Stray Gods has, but if you have original songs, you do those branching paths. If so, how do you make sure those paths branch in a good way? How do you keep the songs coherent if you're changing up what they might mean at different points? How do you make sure the songs even just sound good? Fourth, musicals are kind of a hard sell in just about every medium. You've got movie musicals like Mean Girls and Wonka right now that are desperately trying to hide the fact that they're musicals in hopes of tricking people into watching them, which is very funny because I can't imagine people who hate musicals will be all that happy about being tricked into seeing one. Pitching a musical is hard regardless of the medium, but all of these factors combined make it especially understandable that musical video games are pretty rare. At least that's what I thought when I started working on this, but as I was thinking it through, I wanted to ask a different question. Are they actually all that rare? I mean look, there aren't many games that are calling themselves musicals, but like, what actually is a musical? Is it just anything that calls itself one? Or maybe there are some things that are hiding their musical identity. Like, okay, there are a lot of video games with music, and I definitely wouldn't call all of them musicals. Just Dance 2020 isn't a musical. Stray Gods is. But what about Elite Beat Agents? Elite Beat Agents is a rhythm action DS game where someone in crisis will call the EBA to basically cheerlead them to success in whatever they're doing, which can range from helping a pregnant woman get to the hospital in time to safely deliver a baby, to bringing back the ghost of a dead father to celebrate Christmas before having to save the world from an alien invasion that can only be beaten with dance. I would argue that Elite Beat Agents is a jukebox musical, but you might argue that they're just dancing instead of singing or otherwise performing the music. I could make a similar argument for Dance Central, where you're similarly trying to save the world by working your way up to becoming the best dancer in town before having to defeat a villain in some sort of a dance-off, but again, you can make a similar argument. What about Guitar Hero 3, though? It has a paper-thin plot, but there is a plot, and the music is still how you progress through that plot, and the characters are performing the music in the songs. Even Just Dance has started to have a connected narrative between its songs, where there is actually a story happening that is being advanced via the songs. I mean look, earlier we talked about how genres exist to try and help people figure out if a piece of media is something they'd want to watch. If you like action movies, and a movie is labeled as an action movie, you're a lot more likely to watch it than if that same movie is labeled as a tragedy, or a drama, or a comedy if you don't like those genres. However, if you're trying to market to a certain audience, you might kinda... fudge the genres a bit. If you're trying to really appeal to a niche audience, you might really emphasize a niche genre that's part of your story. And if you're trying to broaden the appeal of your media, you might let those more niche genres slide off the bottom of the advertisements. We've talked about examples where it hasn't really worked so far, you know, Mean Girls and Wonka, but the fact that two movies have failed to pull the wool over people's eyes doesn't mean that other media hasn't succeeded. Like, okay, is the Barbie movie a musical? I mean, it does have a bunch of musical numbers that are meant to advance the plot, and they are very deliberately presented as musical numbers. Most obviously with the I'm Just Ken song, which is making a clear reference to a bunch of other musicals. Now, I'm not saying it's objectively a musical or anything like that, don't get your pitchforks out, but I am saying that genre exists as a marketing tool. And if musicals were popping off right now, you could have absolutely cut a whole bunch of trailers for the Barbie movie where you presented it as a musical and advertised it as one to trick people into the theaters, only for them to then get mad that it wasn't a musical. Earlier, I said people who hate musicals would be pissed if they went to a movie that had never been advertised as one, and I think to some degree that's true, but I'd argue that stuff like Barbie presents a pretty compelling argument that you can at least get musical adjacent in a way that doesn't alienate a non-musical loving audience. When it comes to video games, I would also make the argument that we do have a lot of games that are actually musicals in terms of using musical performances as a major component of telling the story. And we just don't think of them that way because musicals are often lumped together in a single genre that people write off collectively, the same way they'll say, I listen to everything except for country and rap when it comes to music. The problem though is that genre is fake. It isn't real. You're writing off media based on arbitrary boundaries that exist because record labels and movie studios and video game publishers and every other type of company responsible for trying to convince you to give them money for a piece of media had to decide what they thought would sell best. That's not to say they're entirely useless as a concept, but they're not as useful as we sometimes pretend they are. Again, this video is about the genres that gaming struggles with, and in the last two sections we talked about true crime as a genre that's kinda incompatible with video games as a medium, and about tabletop role-playing games as a genre where the financial incentives and limitations of the medium make it really hard to pull off. However, when it comes to musicals, video games as a medium struggle in an entirely different way. 
Namely, they struggle with the stigma associated with the genre as a concept. Musicals and video games are fighting a battle to be musicals without being slapped with that dreaded label for the most part, and we've developed a whole bunch of other terms for them like rhythm action games, dancing games, or even just music games to avoid actually calling them a musical if that label applies. And there are a lot of popular games that I think would fall under this category. Rapper the Rapper is a famously beloved game. Guitar Hero 3 was like the only game any 10 year old boy wanted for Christmas in 2007. Not every game with music is a musical. Again, I'm gonna emphasize that that's not something I'm trying to say here. And I would still argue that there still needs to be a narrative that's being told through both traditional acting and dialogue as well as through musical performances. But a lot of games start to meet that description once you start to think about it. And to be very clear here, that's a good thing. Musicals are fun if they're done well, and we miss out on a lot of joy when we just write them off as stupid or silly or whatever else. I think there are a lot of people who would have loved Stray Gods if they'd been willing to give it a chance, but might have seen it and immediately written it off because it's called a musical. Maybe Mean Girls and Wonka do have the right idea, and the problem isn't that they tried to trick people, only that they got caught. That's not even counting pieces of media that are objectively musicals, but a ton of people just kind of act like they aren't. Like, if you're someone who thinks they hate musicals, do you also hate all the animated Disney musicals? You're gonna tell me Megara's performance of I Won't Say I'm In Love from Disney's Hercules doesn't fuck? You're gonna lie to my face? Absolutely not. Won't tolerate it. The disdain for musicals and video games, or really any medium, is even more absurd when you think about it for just like 30 seconds in terms of how a good piece of music in a game just hits different sometimes. Like, as someone who has some mixed feelings about Cyberpunk 2077 despite overall liking it, there's nothing in me that could bring me to deny how much some of that soundtrack pulls me in. You hit me with some of that I really want to stay at your house at the right time and I'm just like, nostalgic for something I can't even really describe. Music is one of the oldest ways of communicating emotion and meaning that we have as a species, and we have spent millennia innovating new ways to express ourselves through it, and nobody with any sense is going to deny that music can be an amazing way to elevate a piece of media, or to help set the tone, or create tension and excitement in a way that nothing else could do. And yet we let our weird hang-ups about a genre built around using music to tell stories get in the way of not only enjoying so many amazing pieces of media, but also get in the way of creating even more of them. The stigma around musicals makes it a lot harder to get funding for them compared to other types of media unless, you know, you're Disney, or you're going off of a pre-existing property, or you're able to pass it off as something else. And I think it's a real shame to think about all the amazing pieces of media that we might never get to experience because an executive chopped it at a meeting after deciding there wasn't a way to get past that stigma. Ultimately, the point of this video is to emphasize the ways that genre and medium collide in terms of compatibility, incentives, and stigma, and what it means for video games as not just a commercial product, not just a commercial medium, but an art form with actual cultural value that these clashes exist. Are these clashes we want to resolve? If so, why? And how? What would it mean for the medium, and what would it mean beyond the medium? Nothing happens in a bubble. Every medium influences every other medium in big and small ways, whether it's in terms of influencing a stylistic choice, influencing a design decision, or influencing the people who create things in one medium based on their experiences with another. And we have no way of knowing what might happen if we can address issues of compatibility, incentives, and stigma associated with certain genres until we do it. Thank you very much for watching. If you've enjoyed this, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and be sure to thank the lovely Destiny for choosing this topic. This was their reward for being my top donor in my October Donathon, and I'm honestly really happy with how it turned out. I may be taking a break for a couple weeks in January, and I'll be coming back on the 19th with the winning topic from this month's Members' Choice Poll. These are our five topics, and the first round of voting will be open until midnight on January 7th, with the top two immediately moving on to a runoff vote that'll end on the 10th. If you'd like to vote for one of these topics, or you just want to support the videos I make, you can become a channel member for $5 a month by clicking the Join button below. Thank you very much to all my channel members. MiniQ, Olesp, Cage the Orc, Fish Toast, Alex Stone, Name of the Survivor, Dexany, Connor, Yoshi of the Wire, It's Peggy BTW, CatLover192, Sourdough, Aluma Riley, Venus, Monkey 12 Ninja, Cadence, V, and The Leathers. Whether you're a channel member, a subscriber, or you just clicked on this video out of curiosity, thank you very much for watching. Have a happy new year, and I hope I'll see you around in 2024.